Well, hello everyone and welcome to this Meanwhile Elsewhere on Medieval Wales. So in your inquiry, you've been learning about did the Normans bring a truckload of trouble to England? But within this presentation uh, video, we are going to be talking about what was happening in Medieval Wales during the Norman Conquest. And this is just going to add a little bit more information to your inquiry question about whether the Normans brought a truckload of trouble and just help your understanding of the whole history of Britain, not just focus on English history, but also learning a little bit about Welsh history as well. So let's find out more. So this map of the Norman Conquest focuses very much on William's campaigns in England, um, but obviously we can see there on the west of Britain, we can see Wales, and we're going to focus on what might the story of Wales be uh, within the Norman Conquest. So the main historical concepts that we're going to focus on in this learning are the following. We're going to talk about an earl. An earl is an important person in Anglo-Saxon times. So, for example, um, Harold Godwinson, um, Edwin and Morcar were all examples of Anglo-Saxon earls. Edwin being the Earl of Mercia, um, which is kind of like the Midlands area, and Morcar being the Earl of Northumbria. And an earldom is an area of land which is controlled by an earl. Before Harold Godwinson became the King of England, he was an Earl um, of Wessex, and that made him very important and powerful. In fact, during the reign of King Edward the Confessor, um, Harold Godwinson was so powerful, he was known as a second king or other king. Um, Alter Rex was what he was known as. De Hoyabath is the largest kingdom in Wales. It is located in southwest Wales, so we're going to focus on that. A march, march was an old Anglo-Saxon word for a border, and William I, William the Conqueror, built castles along the Welsh marches and created three new earldoms to control this area. We're going to come across the word ap quite a lot within this presentation. Uh, many Welsh names contain ap, and it simply means son of. And then we're going to focus on the idea of a pilgrimage, which you learn about in your RS lessons as well. A pilgrimage is a religious journey. St. David's in Wales, in South Wales, had been a site for pilgrimage since the 6th century. So let's just focus on the Kingdom of Wales. So you can see that a map of Wales, that's what we call a topographical map, which shows us the height of the land. And we can see that one of the distinctive features of Wales is its mountain ranges. Very, very hilly. If you've been to Wales, you might in the north have been to places like Snowdonia. In the south, you may have been to places like the Brecon Beacons. Now, the historian R.R. R. Davis argues that in the 11th century, Wales was, quote, culturally and ethnically more credible and united than were either England or Scotland. So what he means by this is that Wales um, felt very much like a country um, during this time. Um, it felt quite united. And his evidence for this is that Wales had a sole language, Welsh, which united the people together. It had a recognition recognized legal code, which were called the laws of um, Hoyo Dida, and it had a common story and mythology. Obviously, though, looking at that map um, with all the mountain ranges and the different heights of land, Wales was not an easy country to govern. Its mountainous landscape made it really hard for one person to control it. So Wales tended, although it had a little bit of a sense of national identity, um, Wales was also divided up into different kingdoms. And the Welsh name for Wales, by the way, is Cymru, um, which you can see just down there at the bottom of the map. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at the geography of Wales now. So in the north, um, where you can see those um, high mountains, is Snowdonia, which is known as Eriri in Welsh. In the middle of Wales are the Cambrian Mountains, which are known as Elenid uh, in Welsh. And in the south of Wales are the Brecon Beacons, known as Banal Bruceniog in Welsh. And there's been a real focus actually recently in terms of um, making sure that those place names are known by their Welsh language names. And uh, the Welsh language is still very much vibrant within Wales. And if you go to Wales now, you can see signs in the Welsh language as well as the English language as well. So the geography of Wales would affect how easy it was to rule and also um, would present a challenge, obviously, to the Normans if they wanted to try and conquer Wales. So we're just going to focus a little bit about the relationship between the Norman conquest and Wales within this presentation. 
So the Kingdom of Wales, we can see here um, the different kind of regions of Wales during this time with a place like Gwynedd in the north, Powys in the sort of northeast, for example, and then uh, down in the bottom southwest, a uh, really sort of large um, Welsh kingdom, uh, De Hoyabath, and then sort of down in the kind of like southeast region, places like Gwent, for example, Brisceniog, uh, Morganwig. Um, so these are some of the different Welsh kingdoms that were around during this time. Now, Wales was a threat to King Edward the Confessor's rule and William had wanted the border between England and Wales to be made more secure during this time. Previous Anglo-Saxon kings had built their own defences along the border with Wales and the border with Wales was known as the March of Wales. March obviously being an Anglo-Saxon word for a border. So there's a little bit of a relationship web of some of the people that we're going to be um, focusing on in this presentation. So you can see there some of the people that we're going to learn about and you might want to come back to this um, so that you can sort of see all the different relationships between people. So you can see there, for example, Harold Godwinson, you can see Edwin and Morcar, but other people that are important are Edgith or sometimes known as Edith, um, Ilfgar. Um, Gruffid Ap Llewellyn, remember uh, that Ap means son of, so it means Gruffid son of Llewellyn, um, and Tostig Godwinson, and you can see there's some of the key relationships between them, so rather than me kind of go through that, you might want to just pause that so you can see some of the different relationships, and once you find out about some of the characters in the presentation, you may well want to come back to this and think about some of the relationships between them. Obviously, Harold Godwinson and Tostig Godwinson are brothers. Um, Gruffid Ap Llewellyn was married to Edgith, who is the daughter of Ilfgar. Um, we're going to find out, um, no spoilers, but we're going to find out that Gruffid Ap Llewellyn um, gets killed um, during this time period. And then his wife Edith actually marries um, Harold Goblinson. Um, and this is almost to create an alliance really between England and Wales and build bridges between the two countries after Gruffid's uh, death. So there's quite a, quite a complex kind of uh, interweb and, and play of, of different things. Um, Edith is also the um, sister of Edwin and Morcar and Ilfgar, um, who was an important Anglo-Saxon um, earl. Um, he is the father of Edwin and Morcar and also of Edith. So we can see um, here some of the uh, sort of different interplay between some of the different characters, which is, uh, I think, really, really interesting to, to look at. So in terms of Wales and the Norman Conquest and their timeline, in 1039, Gruffid Ap Llewellyn, who we've just um, been introduced to there, becomes the King of Gwynedd, which is in the north, and Powys. Um, so he very much um, makes his... Um, sort of reputation uh, within the north, uh, the kingdoms in the north. Now, between 1039 and 1055, Gruffid Ap Llewellyn was involved in conflicts with rulers of other Welsh kingdoms and raids across the English border. Gruffid Ap Llewellyn allied himself with Ilfgar, who was heir to the earldom of Mercia, and was an enemy of Harold Godwinson, who had taken his earldom from him. Now, Gruffid Ap Llewellyn married Ilfgar's daughter, Eildgith, or Edith, to shore up um, the alliance uh, between uh, the different kingdoms. Now, Gruffid Ap Ruder who is the ruler of De Hoyabath, um, which you can see down there is the largest kingdom in South Wales. He was defeated and killed by Gruffid Ap Llewellyn and Ilfgar's forces working together. And Gruffid Ap Llewellyn became the ruler of the whole of Wales. So this was very much uniting the Kingdom of Wales um, pre the Norman Conquest. Now Gruffid Ap Llewellyn and Ilfgar united forces to attack and defeat Ralph the Timid. Love that. Um, Ralph the Timid at Hereford. Um, he probably wasn't that timid. It was probably a name that was given to him after he was defeated. They sacked, which means they attacked and destroyed the town, and Ilfgar uh, became the Earl of Mercia again. And obviously, Ilfgar, being the father of Edwin and Morcar, um, left that um, Earldom of Mercia to to um, his son um, Edwin. So in 1055, um, King Edward the Confessor, who's the King of England at this time, recognised Gruffid Apple when it at Llewellyn as the King of Wales and peace was agreed between the English and the Welsh kingdoms. Now in 1062-63 um, Ilfgar died, um, he died in 1062 and Ilfgar had been the main ally of Gruffid at Llewellyn's. This made his position, that's Gruffid at Llewellyn's position in Wales, more vulnerable. In late 1062 Harold Godwinson then launched a surprise attack on Gruffin's court at a place called Rudlin. Gruffid though managed to escape but a combined force led by Harold Godwinson and his brother Tostig Godwinson attacked Gruffid at Llewellyn again supported by his Welsh enemies. 
Gruffid retreated to Snowdonia, where he was murdered by his own men. His head and the figurehead of his own ship were delivered to Harold Godwinson as proof of his death. Wales broke up into separate kingdoms. In 1066, Edward the Confessor died and Harold Godwinson became a king of England. And in the spring of 1066, Harold Godwinson married Edith, Gruffid's widow, in an attempt to create an alliance and help Harold Godwinson gain more control over Wales. But on the 14th of October, Harold Godwinson and his Anglo-Saxon army were defeated by the Normans at the Battle of Hastings. And William, Duke of Normandy, was crowned the king of England on Christmas Day, 1066. So this began to, uh, to change everything in terms of what was happening with Wales as well. Now, when William became the King of England, he established three new earldoms um, centred on Hereford, Shrewsbury and Chester. And you can see that Chester is in the sort of north. Um, Shrewsbury is kind of like in, in the middle um, in terms of like where Wales is, obviously, and Hereford's more in the south. And these earldoms are known as the March earldoms. Now, the earldom of Chester was given to a man called Hugh Davranche, who was made the Earl of Chester. His father had contributed 60 ships to William's invasion fleet. The earldom of Shrewsbury went to Roger of Montgomery who was made Earl of Shrewsbury. William trusted him so much that he'd chosen Roger to help govern Normandy while William was leading the invasion of England. And the Earldom of Hereford went to William Fitz Osborne, and he was William's right-hand man in the invasion of England. And it was William uh, Fitz Osborne who built a stone castle at a place called Chepstow, which you can see on the map there, uh, which is right in the sort of um, southeastern part of, um, you know, of where sort of Wales, the Wales English border. So Chepstow Castle, and um, just a little focus on castle building again. In the 11th century, Chepstow Castle played a significant role in the aftermath of the Norman Conquest. Building was started in 1067 by Earl William Fitz Osborne, who was a close friend of William the Conqueror and was one of the first Norman strongholds in Wales. The castle was strategically placed on the border of England and Wales and was a key outpost in the Norman effort to control and secure newly conquered lands. It's a really good example of a castle being really important in the Norman Conquest. Now it began a mott and bailey castle as all norman castles did had a wooden keep on top of a mott and a fortified bailey this was very typical of norman castles and it helped the normans to defend against welsh attacks chepstow castle also uh, deterred it sort of prevented it it stopped the welsh from attacking it deterred welsh attacks and enabled the normans to eventually establish control over wales so William Fitz Osborne, the Earl of Hereford, began to make attacks into South Wales. By 1074, the forces of the Earl of Shrewsbury were also attacking De Hoybarth in South Wales. Now, in 1075, the death of Blethyn ap Sinfin, the King of Powys and Gwynedd in North Wales, led to civil war between the Welsh kingdoms. And this gave the Normans an opportunity to seize lands in northern Wales. In 1081, Gruffydd ap Sinan, who had just won the throne of Gwynedd from Traharin ap Caradog at the Battle of Moynedd Card, was invited to a meeting with the Norman Earl of Chester and Earl of Shrewsbury. He was captured and imprisoned at the meeting and it led to the Normans taking control of most of Gwynedd. In 1081, William I travelled through South Wales on a pilgrimage to St David's. This was a major show of power and he arranged for the king of De Hoyabath, who was called Rhys Ap Tudra, to pay homage to him in return for his kingdom, maintaining good relations with the Norman rulers of England. Rhys Ap Tudra paid £40 per year to William as part of this agreement, but fighting between the Welsh kingdoms continued. And you can see there St David's Cathedral in South Wales. Uh, and just a little bit of information about St. David's, actually, in 1123, actually, St. David's was granted a privilege from Pope Calixtus II in Rome, who declared that two pilgrimages to St. David's were equal to one journey to Rome, which just shows the significance of this as a pilgrimage site. Now, in 1093, a Norman force was responsible for killing Rhys Ap Tudor, the king of De Hoyabath, near the Brecon Beacons. The Brut Ye Twisorgian stated, with him fell the kingdom of the Britons. Now that's the source uh, piece of information that we have around uh, Welsh history at that time. The Normans attempted to take control of De Hoyabath. This was a really significant moment in the Norman conquest of Wales. It seemed like the Norman conquest of Wales was complete. The kingdom of De Hoyabath was seized and divided between various Norman lords. And even though this is after the death of William the Conqueror, it's still the Norman conquest. And it shows that gradually the Normans, it's taken them quite a long time to do it, but had managed to start to take control of Wales. And this led to a period of time in sort of 12th and 13th centuries where there's a lot of conflict um, in Wales. And we can look more about that in our key state three history journey. 
So from 1094 to 1097, the Welsh began to fight back against Anglo-Norman rule. In 1094, Cadwin ap Bledin of Powys defeated a Norman force at the Battle of Coed Ypswys. By 1097, Henry of Huntingdon mentions that the Norman army were finding the terrain of Wales too difficult to continue, and instead of persisting with their conquest, decided to secure the border areas already under control. Eventually, Gruffydd ap Sinan was able to build a strong kingdom in Gwynedd. His son, Owen Gwynedd, joined forces with Gruffydd ap Rhys of Doyabarth and won a huge victory over the Normans at the Battle of Krug Moor in 1136 and took control of Ceredigion, a county in the west of Wales. So thank you very much for listening to that video. You might now want to reflect on our key inquiry question and whether you think the Normans also brought a truckload of trouble to Wales. It's really important to focus on that and to think about the whole history of Britain when we're learning about our history. And hopefully that's given you a little bit of an introduction to some really interesting Welsh history. Thanks very much for listening and a goodbye.